test. Oh, hey, OK. Hi. Uh, first session today. So let's get into it. Uh, this is offline processing on App Engine, a look ahead. Um, I'm Brett Slacken. I'm a software engineer on the Google App Engine team. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about some really cool features that we've been working on for a while that we're going to tell you all about today. Um, so, oh yeah, and really quick, some people thought offline processing was talking about mobile phones and offline. Uh, it's a different kind of offline. This is, this is offline processing, doing work offline as opposed to using your mobile phone when you don't have connectivity. So if you're in the wrong session, uh, you won't hurt my feelings if you leave. All right, so here's our agenda. We're going to talk about a new API, the Task Queue API. We're going to talk about what tasks are. We're going to talk about webhooks. We're going to talk about push versus pull and the performance of, the, of, those, of those models. We're going to talk about item potence, queues and throttling, task names and ETAs. And then we're going to have some example applications using the task queue interspersed through the presentation, including sending email, uh, schema migration, uh, and a right behind cache. And then finally, we're going to talk about the future of offline processing on App Engine and uh, what we have planned, what's coming. Um, so uh, I have a moderator page set up. It's tinyurl.com offline talk. Um, and you can give immediate feedback about this presentation on havasec.com uh, slash io. So please uh, start putting your questions in there. All right, so let's just start from the beginning. Um, let's talk about the motivation of, of what, we're, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so hopefully, as you know, if you've tried it out, Google App Engine is great for web apps. Uh, we're very good for request-based, database-backed uh, applications. Uh, but that's a lot of online processing. It's, you have to do things within the boundaries of a single request. Uh, there, there's a limit to what you can do during that time. Um, there are a lot of applications that fit that model, but there are a lot that don't. Um, and that's why background and batch processing are two highly requested features um, that people have been asking for over and over again. Um, we've delivered that in part with uh, cron, and cron's very useful for doing work periodically every so often. Um, but it's really not good enough if you want to do a lot of work or if you want to do work at a very high frequency, high rate. Um, and if we actually delivered uh, background and batch processing, it would be... It would, it would enable a whole range of new applications on App Engine. So, you know, some people think that not having offline processing is a deal breaker, and uh, we're hoping to remedy that. Uh, so, again, for background, if, why, why do you want to do background processing? Well, I want to do work continuously without user requests. I don't want to have to be bound to a single user request in order to get something done. I want to uh, incrementally process data. I want to compute some results, aggregations, what, whatever, what have you. Um, I also want to smooth out load patterns and uh, reduce user latency. So these are a few of them, and we'll get into what that actually means. But what's really cool about this is that this is a new style of computation on App Engine. Uh, we're doing something fundamentally different than everything we've done before. Uh, up until now, it's really about, you know, what can I do in a single request for my user? Um, my talk yesterday and a lot of articles you've seen on our website talk about ways to optimize for a single request, um, ways to get a lot of work done in a single request, and we're, we can finally move past that uh, with some of the systems we're building here. So uh, we're, we're getting into new territory, and it's, it's really exciting. All right, so let's have an introduction. So we're going to talk about our new API for App Engine. We're calling it the Task Queue API. Now, the Task Queue API is part of a new thing we're calling App Engine Labs. Uh, labs is similar to other Google Labs, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the word labs. Um, so this means that the API may change until it's graduated from labs. Uh, what, what does that mean? So that means we're going to try our best to not make any uh, backwards incompatible changes to the API right now. We're going we're to try to keep it stable, but we're going to make some small changes. We're going to maybe move some things around, make the API nicer in some ways. We're going to listen to your feedback, extend it, take things away, and make it a really good API. Uh, once it's graduated from labs, then we'll, we'll be um, uh, dedicated to having a backwards compatible API for you to use, like the rest of our APIs, where we don't break your application uh, with subsequent releases um, of, our, of our system unless we specifically send you an email telling you and have a, a full version change, uh, which we have not yet done. 
So there'll be a lot of warning um, if we end up having to change it. Another part of uh, App Engine Labs is that we haven't specified how we're gonna do billing yet. Uh, we're still figuring out the details of billing, how this will be billed. Um, you know, we ha um, so we'll you know, look into that later um, if you're wondering about pricing and uh, how that fits into the rest of the billing system. Uh, and hopefully this will be the first of many uh, APIs that we're putting in labs. Now, Task API is not released today. I'm, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm sorry to say that, but it should launch in a couple of weeks. Um, and I do, it's not vaporware. I have live, I have a live version of the task queue uh, running in our actual production uh, clusters, um, and it's on AppSpot, um, so you'll be able to actually see it in action and take it for a spin for yourself. Um, and it has uh, working code, and uh, so I'll be sharing that with you. Okay, so let's just do some overview, some background, uh, since this is kind of a new thing for a lot of people. Uh, so what is a task queue? Well, it's a simple idea in general. Um, you describe the work that you wanna do right now. So you, you, know, some, you have some idea, I need to do something. Um, you describe it, and you save that description of the work somewhere very quickly. And then later on, you come back and you execute that work. Three steps. Um, the work that, that you have saved, the descriptions you've saved, are executed in the order they were received. So it's a best effort, first in, first out queue. So things that were added first get done first, things added later will get done later. Um, another important thing is that if execution fails of this work, it'll be retried until it's successful. So you have a very uh, high level of confidence that something you put in a queue will be completed. Now the smallest example of a task queue API would be something like this. Uh, task queue.add some description of the work, whatever that means. Do this later. Uh, no, what is a task queue? Why is it beneficial? Why is it useful? Well, first of all, it's asynchronous. Uh, why do anything right now if I could do it later? I'm very lazy. I don't want to have to wait. Um, so instead of you know, doing some very expensive, very high latency operation, I'll just record the fact that I have to do it at some point in the future and then just deal with it later. Um, because of that, um, so that's one part. Um, the other part is that uh, it lets me do many operations at the same time asynchronously so that I don't have dependencies between my um, between my code of, of waiting and stuff like that. Uh, it's fundamentally more event-driven. Uh, but this also results in uh, lower latency for our users. So tasks are lightweight. Um, they're about three times faster than our data store. So if you want to save a task to describe to do some work in the future, it's really fast. Uh, tasks are also reliable. So what I was saying before, once you write a task, um, the guarantee is that we'll, it will eventually complete. Um, depending on what your code does, but if you have working code, it'll eventually complete. And tasks are scalable. Um, the storage of new tasks has no contention. You're just appending to the end of a very large list. So you can keep appending all the way to the end. Um, we can store those tasks across a lot of machines, so we can scale that out very well. And the best part is that you can parallelize work with multiple workers. You can have a lot of workers pulling off the front of a queue and uh, completing work getting it done in parallel so you can do a lot of computation simultaneously. And there are a lot of features you can add to this basic concept. So historically, what is a task queue? Um, well, Unix had at and batch commands. Do this work, run the shell command at this time. Um, and they had ways of evaluating a queue, adding things to a queue. Um, it's kind of an old style of doing it. Uh, what you hear about a lot of people in the Django and Rails community do is they use a uh, kind of poor man's queue. Um, some people have done this on App Engine already. Uh, you use cron jobs and flat files um, to build a queue. You append an entity or a line to a queue um, for every time you need to do some more work. And then ever so often you wake up and just consume the whole file and the whole queue um, uh, with a cron job. Uh, for a lot of people, that's what a task queue is. Uh, but there are a lot of reliability and scalability issues here. You, you're locked into a single machine that contains a queue. Um, it's very hard to parallelize work. Um, and uh, there are some failure scenarios you have to deal with. Um, it works, but it's really uh, not ideal. Um, but there, there are other task queue systems out there that, that are good. Um, and let's talk about some of them. So there's a long list. It's a very, very long laundry list. Um, here I have star MQ. Star MQ is all the MQ systems out there. There's um, 
ActiveMQ from Apache, there's RabbitMQ, which is Erlang, um, there's Microsoft MQ, WebSphere MQ, um, basically any vendor MQ. Uh, there's Amazon Simple Queue Service, Azure Queues from Microsoft. Um, there's the Schwartz, open source queuing service. Uh, Twisted has some queue-like asynchronous stuff in it. Starling is a uh, in-memory in queue that's getting kind of popular. Uh, Beanstalk D is kind of the same idea, and there's a lot others, a lot others. Uh, but one thing I'd like to point out here is that task queues are often conflated with PubSub messaging. Uh, people talk to us and they say, we want, we want task queues, or no, we want PubSub, or we want JMS, or I want a messaging system. It's like, well, what, what do you want? What do you actually want to do? So let's, let's define what we're actually talking about here so you can understand the motivation of our API and, and why it is the way it is. So queuing systems maximize data throughput. That's what they're for. Routers, data pipelines, these are queuing systems. They fully saturate a network. CPU, disk, they're meant for throughput. That's the goal. PubSub systems are about transactions and decoupling. Now, what do I mean by decoupling? I mean you can have uh, consumers and producers on the same network, maybe multiple uh, consumers for a single producer, and the consumers and producers don't need to know anything about each other. You can change the software on either side. Um, they have some contract between them that lets them be decoupled. Uh, businesses really like this because it lets them uh, be agile and change vendors and, uh, you know, get around lock-in, all this other stuff. Um, PubSub is very useful for that. It's good at large numbers of small transactions per second. It's good for one-to-many fan-out. When you're changing the receivers, you're adding new business logic, new business rules. And a lot of the time, uh, PubSub systems, uh, MQ systems, have a lot of extra things added to them. They've got filtering. They've got guaranteed ordering. Uh, you can have two-phase commit in there. Um, there's a whole slew of other rules and transformations that a lot of these systems do. Um, and that's all very interesting stuff. Um, there are some really good use cases for it. But our goal here is queuing, not PubSub. We're looking for high throughput, maximizing data throughput. So that's an important distinction uh, to keep in mind. So here's how a normal task queuing system or MQ system works. Um, you have a queue, uh, newer tasks going to the right. You have some queue mediator or set of queue mediators. They look at the head of the queue. They pop off that head. Um, and then you have a series of workers um, that are polling the queue mediator for new tasks. So worker A, B, and C constantly are contacting the mediator saying, hey, do you have any work yet? And the queue mediator says no, and then it goes back and forth. And the workers are always running, they're, they're always polling, uh, they're sitting there doing nothing most of the time, depending on what your queue is doing. Now, polling has problems, uh, a lot of problems. I, yeah, I don't like polling at all. Um, the worker sits in a loop, polling the front of the queue. That means it's not event-driven, that's wasted work. That's just a lot of, hey, you know, like a little child tugging at somebody's shirt or something like that. Um, it's just a waste of, of time for, for the worker. Um, the workers stay resident when there's no work to do, and that just wastes machine resources. You have all these workers for peak load that you don't need just sitting there doing nothing. Another problem is that it's a fixed number of workers. Uh, you have this IT burden. Uh, admins have to manually add more workers to keep up with the queue, um, or the queue grows without bounds. So you need to sit there and say, oh man, at noon my queue gets to one million items long, I really need to spool up a few more workers during that time, or you just leave those workers on all the time. So you've got this management burden in your head you have to think about with polling to make sure that you kind of keep things under control, and you have to, you have to yourself as an administrator be constantly readjusting your worker pool to properly handle your task queue to make sure it's um, low latency. And, th and the other problem with polling is that there's a limited amount of optimization possible. Um, so many systems do fake a polling interface with something that's event-driven under the hood. Um, Essentially, they use long-lived connections to say, hey, give me something whenever you're ready, and I'll just hang on this connection. And then the queue mediator eventually gets a task and then sends it down the wire. Um, so you can, you can reduce some of the latency from when a task is in queued to when it's executed, uh, but you still have this fundamental problem of workers, number of workers, queue size, et cetera. So how, how is our task queue different? We don't pull, we push. We push tasks to your app. There's no polling necessary. That's, that's big. The second big thing is that we are doing tasks as webhooks. 
So when you want to execute a task, we're using webhooks as the interface. Now, what are webhooks? Uh, it's a restful, push-based interface for doing work. Um, it's a concept that's used outside of Google, outside of App Engine, uh, but we really like this style, and a lot of our coming APIs are gonna use this style. Um, you should go to this Wikipedia page if you wanna know more. Essentially, what you're doing is describing uh, an interface through simple HTTP. A uh, set of URLs, post body says, here's the input interface and here's the output interface that I expect. So your, interf your, your standard communication interface becomes HTTP. That's all webhooks are. Uh, a great example of, of a webhook system is Google Code has a post commit webhook. So that anytime someone commits to the SVN repository, you can get an HTTP post to your web server so you can do all kinds of cleanup or send emails or do an announcement, et cetera. So it's a really easy way to interface server-to-server uh, -server communication um, to integrate systems together. So webhooks are really great. Now in App Engine, we're doing tasks as webhooks. So a task, when you define a task, you're just defining an HTTP request you want to have executed. You give us the URL, the, the body of the HTTP request, the method, headers, uh, query string parameters, um, content type, et cetera. You just define, hey, I want this request later on, on this handler. You enqueue that task, and then we send your app the request later. Um, if you're, and then the interface is, if your webhook, so, so we make that request with all the parameters you wanted, and then if your webhook gives us back an HTTP 200 okay, then it's done. Anything else, we will say that the task failed, and we'll back off and retry later. So it's really simple. The interface is whatever you want it to be, it's just HTTP. So here's a really simple example of this. Uh, I've defined a, this is Python, I've defined a web, uh, web request handler here. Uh, it takes posts, um, and it's using our mail API to send an email. Um, so it's sending an email from me at example.com. It's pulling some uh, query string posts, uh, for, for some form uh, encoded, um, uh, parameters, uh, so I get the two subject and the body, and I just send the mail, that's it. It's just a really simple, you could have a form that drives this very simpler, uh, simply. And then to enqueue a task, I just say, oh yeah, here's where my handler is, uh, handler is. here are the parameters that I wanna encode, and that's it, add it. So this calls this, just sometime in the future. Now, why would you wanna do it in this case? Well, our mail API is synchronous. So when you send an email, you're looking at, you know, 500 milliseconds, one second, two seconds to send that email. Um, if a user's clicking a button, that could be a, a bad experience for them. So by doing it this way, you're looking at, you know, 10, 20, 30 milliseconds for getting the task enqueued, and, and you're on your way. It's a lot faster. So, demo. Um, this is, this is a funny demo because I don't have uh, Gmail loaded, so I'll just show you how fast it is, though. I don't know if you've ever used uh, mail sending, but I'm just gonna send an email to myself. Um, so by the time that reloads, I've sent an email to myself. Uh, it's really fast. That's me enqueuing a task over and over again. Uh, I'm not gonna bring up my email. I have all kinds of uh, personal conversations with my grandma, so I'm sorry I didn't clear those out before today. <laughs> um, but you get the idea. It's, it's quicker. Um, oh, wrong slide. All right. So let's talk about how our task queue works. Um, so it looks exactly the same, except we've inverted a lot of the relationships here. Uh, we still have a task uh, queue. Uh, we still have a queue mediator. Uh, the arrows go in the other direction. The queue mediator is pulling off of head, and then when, whenever there's work, and then it's sending it to your request handler. If there's no work to do, you don't have any request handlers active. There are no active threads you're not wasting any resources on workers that aren't doing anything. Uh, conversely, if you have more work to do, we just spool up more threads. Uh, it's just the way App Engine works with handling HTTP requests, we do the exact same thing for tasks. So if you have more work to do in your queues, we will spool up uh, a lot of threads to, to consume them. And as soon as that work is done, we'll pull those threads back in again. Um, and they don't cost anything to have, it doesn't cost anything to have those threads resident. So we're ad automatically adjusting the worker threads based on the load to the needs of your application and the needs of your queue. So you get to save a lot of waste uh, just, just from that inversion of the model from, from pull and pull to push. 
Um, so yeah, so we, we add worker threads uh, depending on the workload. Uh, the maximum number of threads depends on your throughput. So if your tasks take, you know, 30 seconds each, it's gonna be, you're gonna have a lower overall throughput of tasks per second. Um, uh, but yeah, but we have a high maximum uh, rate limit for tasks per second processed. Um, so you can get a lot of work done. Uh, and another thing that's great is that it's just integrated in the admin console as normal requests. So all the things that you already use with App Engine to debug your requests and look at your logs and figure out how things work, they continue to work right now. Um, the application and request logs are still searchable. You can get all of your logs from your request handlers. You can see the webhook response codes, 200 OK or 500s. Um, you can scan through your logs, do regex searches, all that stuff. The dashboard statistics um, and error rate monitoring are still there. So one of the things that's really great about our admin console is we show um, per URL CPU usage on average. So using that exact same idea, you can have a URL that's your mail worker or a URL that's your compute worker, and you can see, oh, each one of my tasks is taking 200 milliseconds of CPU time on average. So you can, you, you can, you can use the same scheme of URLs and URL monitoring to optimize your application. CPU cycle, what? Uh, CPU cycle? Oh, 200 milliseconds of CPU time. So, well, ask me that question later. Um, we, on App Engine, we define resources in terms of CPU time, so it's a standard CPU, um, yeah. So, uh, oh yeah, and so the same thing with error rates. We, we, we monitor error rates, so if you wanna see how many tasks in your queue has an, have an error, um, you get to see that too. So all the nice things in the admin console, uh, including graphs, they're all there. So let's get into some details and some more examples. Um, so first of all, I wanna warn you about something uh, called idempotence. Um, idempotence is a mouthful of a word. Um, if you're a programmer, you've probably heard it before, but it took me a while to remember exactly what it meant. Um, eff effectively, what idempotence is, is that, you know, we need to be able to run the same task repeatedly without harmful effects. Um, or at least effects that are acceptable, like sending a duplicate email. Now, why is this necessary? It's necessary because failure can happen at any time. With our Task Queue API, we're giving you a guarantee that the task will be retried until it's successful. But it's on you to actually implement the task handler. Um, so you need to keep in mind that your, your tasks may run twice on accident, um, either because of your code or because of a failure of one of our systems, um, or even in good cases without server failures, it's still theoretically possible for a task to run twice. So you need to be idempotent. Um, it's, it's your responsibility as the application developer to ensure that your tasks are idempotent, so that if you run the same task twice, you have a way to figure out either I did this before or I can do this again and it's not harmful. And they won't run in parallel, that's a good question. Um, one task is only running on one thread at one time, um, but there are, are still tiny little edge cases where it could be two, and we're getting into some cookbook kind of stuff to make sure that that doesn't happen too. But uh, yeah, you, you should be guaranteed that you have uh, tasks running, only one task should be running in one place at a time, but yeah, it's the same concept. Idempotent, idempotent operations require you to, uh, require uh, your application to allow for repeats, um, sometimes simultaneously. Right, so the question is, uh, could you use memcache to say I already did this, or the data store? Yeah, you could do something like that. There's some latency issues of doing that, but yeah, there's some, you could use memcache locks, you could use a few other techniques to make sure that you don't do things multiple times. Um, but again, the burden is on you as a developer. We don't, we don't do this for you, but we give you tools to, to do it. Uh, now let's talk about queues. Um, we've talked about tasks, we also have queues, this is a task queue uh, API. Um, so each task is added to a single queue for execution. And we allow for multiple queues in an application. So what is a queue? Well, a queue provides isolation and separation of tasks. So that means that, uh, you know, it's a FIFO queue. Um, tasks enter at the back and go to the, to the front. Maybe one queue is slower than some other queues. Um, you wanna have isolation between them. Maybe you want one queue to run faster than another. Um, you can do all that by configuring your queues. Um, a queue in our system is really just a line. It's, it's, it's a, a queue, a list of items that have to progress in that order. And so if you, if you care about the ordering um, across multiple tasks with different priorities or something like that, you can use different queues to control that. 
Uh, and you do it with a QYAML file. Um, so here's an example. I have two queues, a mail queue, which I only want to have work um, 2,000 times a day. And I have a speedy queue, which I want running at a maximum consume rate of five per second. So this is fundamentally different than your normal task queuing system. With a lot of task queuing systems, you, you spool up new workers when you think you need to do more work. On our side, we're like, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna run a lot of tasks per second. You need to tell us a reasonable maximum um, so that we don't overload things. Um, and in the future, we've thought about uh, also putting maximum, maximum number of tasks in flight simultaneously per queue or a maximum burn rate of CPU per queue, uh, something you could specify in this file. There's a lot of things we could add here. We're still figuring out what you guys want. Uh, but why would you actually want to throttle? Well, um, you may want to combine work periodically, um, execute the work in batches. Um, uh, you may want to ensure the stability of your workload, make sure that your CPU and bandwidth and dollar spend is consistent. You can use Q-throttling to make sure that you don't exceed the maximum rights per second of a single entity group in the data store. Uh, make sure that you don't overload a partner site with web service calls, send two emails at a time, or hit your email quota. Um, and it also just enables the prioritization of work. So remember that tasks are defined as a webhook. Tasks go to any URL. So you have as many receivers as you want as you have URLs. Uh, so the routing of the tasks is totally independent of the queues. The queues are just a way of throttling your tasks. So think of, think of queues as, as a way to do flow control of your tasks that's independent of what the tasks actually do. And to illustrate that, I have this many-to-many -many queue throttling uh, diagram. So on the left side, I have the mail tasks. Uh, mail tasks, fetch tasks, and compute tasks. They're totally different tasks. They go to different handlers, completely separate from everything else. On the right side, I have a bunch of workers that handle each of those uh, corresponding tasks. Now I have three queues at a different rate, each providing, say, a different level of service, a different CPU burn, depending on how important I think something is. Um, if I have a customer that I think is really important, I want their email to go out first. Other free customers, I put them in the queue with the rest of the people who have uh, low priority emails to send. So, you, so the queue, again, is not bound to the task. They're independent. The queue is a way of, of keeping track and controlling um, your task's progress. So keep that in mind. All right, so let's do some more concrete examples. Um, the first one is schema, or, so we, we, did, uh, we did the first one, which is uh, sending mail. Another one is schema migration. This is people have said, how do I do a schema migration on App Engine? We finally have uh, a decent answer for you. So uh, before, you could use cron, a cron job to slowly iterate through entities, uh, migrate them, and then s store your entity location in memcache. Um, the problem with this is that it, it was slow. You'd have to periodically wake up, do a little bit of work, and then go back to sleep over and over. Um, you couldn't parallelize any of the work. Um, just generally, it was slow. It wasn't event-driven. Uh, you, you had to do a lot of waiting. Uh, another option was to use the remote API or the bulk loader to dump the whole data set and re-upload it. Uh, that's slow. uses a lot of bandwidth, a lot of CPU. A lot of the time, your transformations are very tiny. Um, sometimes you can edit your entities in place. You don't even have to rewrite them. Um, so there's just a lot of costs associated with re dumping your entire data store. Now, with the task API, it gets, it gets a lot easier. Um, you define a handler to query for the next n entities. You modify them, update them in batch, and then enqueue a task to resume after the current position. Uh, and a failure at any point will cause a task to be retried later, picking up exactly where you left off. So let's look at some code to do this. So first of all, I have, here's my really simple schema. I have uh, two, two model classes, uh, a first user kind, a second user kind. Initially, I just had a name. Uh, later, I realize I want to be able to sort by last name, so I have the second user kind um, with the first and last name separated. Then I have two migration functions. I have give me a second user kind from the first and vice versa. So you'll see that to get a second user kind, I just split on the space, and that gets me the first and last name. And for, uh, for the other way around, I just combine them together. So here's a migration function. This is inside a web request handler, um, uh, just like any other web request handler that would be, uh, that would be receiving the webhook call of, for the task. So I query, uh, so here, there's a few hidden variables. I'll explain what they mean. Uh, from, so the from kind is the, the model class that I'm uh, migrating from. Um, so that'll be either first or second kind. Um, and then, so I will start a query on those. 
um, if I have a position, um, like if I'm iterating through the list, I have a start position I'm keeping track of. So I'm doing a key query to page through all my data as I do my migration. So that's what this if is. Um, so then I grab 10 of the old entities. If there are no old entities done, uh, if there are no old entities left, I'm done. Um, otherwise, I figure out, you know, here are my old entities, I get the next one. Um, so this is where I'll start for the next batch. And then I migrate all my entities to create the new list. So migrate X for X and old. Then I put the new entities and I delete the old entities. And then I enqueue another task to do the exact same web request handler again uh, with the start equal to my next position. Uh, and then the kind being the same migration path. So the same, same migration kind, the from, the from kind. Now, what's really interesting about this example is it illustrates the important order of operations for item potence. So for instance, um, you'll notice that I first migrate, so first I query for all the old ones, and then I put the new ones in the data store. So if the query failed, I'll start at exactly the same place. If putting the new ones in the data store, if the, sorry, if the order were reversed and I deleted the new one, or deleted the old ones before putting the new ones, I could lose data. So I want to migrate and write the new ones, have duplicate data before I delete the old ones, so that we, we can have failures there. Another thing that's not clear from this is that in the migration function, I need to make sure that I can put the same entity twice. So if I migrate from schema one to schema B, uh, schema A to schema B, I can, uh, I can overwrite schema B if the task reruns over and over again. And that's item potence, to make sure that if there's a failure during that put, that I don't have duplicate data. Um, and, uh, and then finally, uh, if the delete fails halfway through, that's fine, I've already done a put, and my, my query won't give me anything, so I'll just move on. Um, so I can give you a demo of this. Um, so again, this is running on AppSpot. Um, so here's schema migration. So I have a, uh, I have a series of names, Hungry Time, Fluffy Cat, Upside Down, Thunder Sandwich, a bunch of weird ones. Uh, these are some names of people I know. And I have, I have a little script to add names, and I can migrate uh, from the first entity kind to the second entity kind. So I'll just click the button, it'll start migrating, and it's done. Now you'll notice that it returned a partial migration before the request was even done. So, so let, me, let me go back the other way to show you what I'm talking about, how fast it is. Um, so now let's go second to first. I click the button, and it's already, three of them are already done. And by the time I reload again, now they're all done. So if you, if you actually go into, uh, here I have my request logs, to show you what, this in action, um, you'll see, uh, you see here's my start migration request. And it's at 56 seconds. This is hard to read, but I'll just explain it to you. So this served a 302 result at 50, uh, 56 seconds, 0.83. By 56 seconds, 0.87, 40 milliseconds later, my migration task was already in flight. And then after that, um, at 56.95, right here, um, I've finally refreshed the page. That means that we're dispatching the tasks to your workers before the browser completes a round trip. That's how fast we're doing this. When you, when you add a task, it's, it can actually be re-entrant, so that the task is executing before the API call comes back. So it's very fast. All right, so we have two more, little thing, uh, two more little things to cover, and then we'll have one more example, and then we'll get to some questions. Keep going here. Uh, another nice thing we have, uh, which is an advanced feature of tasks, is we have an ETA. Uh, now this is more of like the at and batch uh, old Unix commands. It's an estimated time of arrival. It says how long until the task should be executed. So I can add a task now and say, hey, in five minutes I wanna do this, in one hour I wanna do this, in a day I wanna do this. Um, now, this is very different than visibility timeout. Visibility timeouts are something you hear about in Azure, Azure uh, queues and uh, uh, sim simple queue and service and a few others. Um, visibility timeouts are more about eliminating um, uh, possibly uh, overlapping workers. Um, this is unrelated to those. Uh, so this is just useful for defining work to do in the relatively near future. Um, it's, it's more fine-grained and, uh, and gives you more programmatic, programmatic control than cron. Um, and it has a bunch of useful things you can do. Um, you can periodically clear a, a cache, flush a buffer, uh, report some incremental results, prioritize some tasks based on a schedule 
uh, with a short time window or based on a schedule um, of some algorithm you've developed. If you have a, I can think of a bunch of them, but you know, if, if you know that, oh, five minutes from now I need to wake up and do something. Um, that's what an ETA is good for uh, without having to have another cron job sitting there polling for new work to do. So again, it's, ETAs are supposed to eliminate polling. Another thing that we provide are names. So each task has a unique name given by the app. If you don't give us an app, uh, if the app doesn't give us uh, a name, then we will auto-generate an, uh, an ID for you. Um, but what's interesting is that if, if you give us this name, uh, we'll do something cool with it. So when the task is done, we'll actually tombstone that task for a few days. Um, we'd like to make that configurable eventually. Um, but what this does is if you add another task with the same name, uh, you'll get an error. Uh, so this lets you enforce only one semantics. So why is that useful? Well, I showed you my schema migrate button. Um, my data set's kind of trivial, it doesn't matter. What if I click that button twice in a row really fast? What would happen? I'd have a bunch of workers working in parallel trying to hurt each other, uh, potentially breaking my system. Um, so uh, with, only one, uh, with only one semantics, I can make it so that the first task I insert to kick off the process will only ever be inserted once, and if it's inserted again, you'll get an error. So I can, I can be guaranteed that, that the beginning of this flow or some part of a task flow will only happen once. Um, so, you know, migrate the schema for these entities once and only once. Okay, so now let's have another concrete example of some of the things you can do. I'm trying to just give you a taste for these, uh, these various options. Um, so this one's, um, it's a little more complicated. Um, this, uh, this one kind of, so the other ones are kind of about offline work, um, talking about uh, schema migration or, or uh, latency elimination. Um, this, one's, this one's load elimination. This is a way of making your app more efficient, more cost effective using the task queue. So what is a write behind cache? Um, so a write behind cache minimizes uh, writes by repeatedly flushing a cache. So essentially what you do is you write data to the, uh, write new data, modify data to the cache and only to the cache, and uh, like an in-memory cache. And then you periodically read that cache and persist it to disk. Now why would you want to do this? Well, the benefit is that data by, database writes are no longer, they no longer increase as a function of user traffic. So you can actually put your database writes on a schedule. Say, hey, I don't want to do this, do a database write more than once per second. So then you can turn 100 cache writes per second into one database write per second. You've somehow suddenly decoupled your traffic uh, from your database load patterns. So that gives you a huge amount of scalability that you, you couldn't have, you couldn't do before. Uh, now there's, there's a problem. Um, there's a small time window where you can lose the data that was in the cache. Uh, but if you think about it, there's always a small time window where you can lose this data. Uh, the data can be lost over the wire at any point in time. The response can not get back to the client. Um, even a data store uh, transaction can fail halfway through, which it would roll back in that case. But uh, you know, you are always dealing with small failure windows. Um, so I think it plays well into those same failure failure windows. Now I have a I have a diagram to show you how this works. Um, this is a sequence diagram, UML style sequence diagram, time, time, if you're not familiar with this, time goes both down and right, kind of, but um, yeah, time is going towards the bottom of the screen. So the user is using a web application, um, and they do some data modification. Uh, that goes to a request handler, which writes into the cache, which is a very fast operation. Um, then they add a task, which is also a very fast operation. Uh, and, and remember, again, the cache is super fast for writes and reads, and adding tasks uh, has no contention, also very fast. So scales very well. Then we res return a response to the user, either from the, using the cache as the data store, uh, the cache as the, the uh, source of record, or, or, um, or just telling the user to wait a little while. Now, sometime in the future, the task queue will dispatch that task. The task will go to a request handler. I I'm kind of not showing that here because it's kind of confusing. Um, but the task, will, the task as it executes will do a periodic read from the cache, um, and then it will go and write in batch to the data store the data from the cache. So, so you, you see that we, we have, uh, we, we write to cache at the top. That's step one, that's, that's all the stuff up here. And then down here is where we actually purge the cache or flush the cache uh, to disk. 
Now, the problem that can happen here is the cache can fail in this window. Um, now, if, if you saw what I showed you before, uh, tasks are dispatched in a reentrant manner. They happen really fast. So that window can be very small, and that window is also configurable by your code. Um, you can set how long, you, how often you want to purge the cache um, or um, write the cache out. So it's up to you to figure out what your tolerance for error is and, and what you're willing to accept in, in, in terms of uh, failures. But our cache is very stable. Memcache is very reliable. Uh, and most of the time, the vast majority of the time, this is a huge win and this cache failure is, is not a big problem. Uh, oh, and also mentioned that there are a lot of things you can do on the client side to, all, to deal with cache failures like this. So the, the client can do an operation um, and then verify that it actually worked, uh, you know, 10, 20 seconds later. So let's go with a, a really concrete example of how to use write behind cache. Um, Something that people have asked for a bunch of times um, are page hit counters or just counters in general. So without the task queue API, um, you had to use something like sharded counters, which are relatively expensive, problematic, use a lot of storage space, um, still have timeouts. Um, they they're, uh, were a good Band-Aid, um, but they really don't give you any control over write throughput. You're doing, still doing a data store write on every single increment. With the task queue, we use a write behind cache. Every time a hit comes in, you just increment a counter in memcache, uh, and then enqueue a task. Then with your task, you just copy the value from memcache and then write it to data store. And you use the queue throttle rates that we talked about before to limit the max writes per second you want in your data store. So some of you, if, you've put, if you put our data store to the test, you know that uh, if you exceed some amount of writes per second for a single entity group or a single entity, uh, you'll start to get some timeouts or contention. Um, this is a way of eliminating that. You just say, hey, I know that experimentally I've verified that this is the fastest I can write this entity. I will just throttle my queue to that many per second, and that's that. Um, and then on the client side, from the request handler side, you can read from memcache or the data store. Both are sufficient sources of record because the, the, the window between when the cache is updated and the data store is updated is very small, or it's sm as small as you want it to be. So let's look at some code. I have a counter. Um, here it's an integer property. I have index set to false just because I want it to be fast. That's a new uh, feature we have. Let's you have an unindexed, unindexed property. My counter handler, this is where I actually, this is the user code that increments the counter. Um, so I pull the key out of the request. Um, I go to memcache and I try to increment the key. Um, if the key was not already in memcache, I'll get back none. So then I'll try to add the key to memcache with the number one. Um, if my add was not successful, that will also fail, uh, which means that somebody else added that number at the same time I did, uh, which means that I can actually increment again. This is kind of a funny kind of like two-step lock scheme with memcache to make sure that you never drop a count. Um, but effectively, these three lines of code here, um, just, they just ensure that I'm incrementing by one. Uh, and then once I've done that, I add a dirty flag, uh, which basically just uh, says in memcache that um, uh, this, this, uh, this counter needs to be written to data store. And uh, what's key here is I'm using memcache add. Memcache add only adds if it hasn't been added before. And if, it has, if, it, if it's already been added, then I get back false. And so, so what that means is that I only add a task to the queue when I know there's not already a task uh, in the queue. Okay, so, so, so if there's a task in flight or a task that's gonna run, I don't do anything. I just, I just sit there because I know eventually the flush is gonna happen. Uh, but, if, but if the task isn't going to run, then I enqueue the task. So then on the worker side, I just have another, it's just another web request handler. You'll see I have my task defined, I have a worker URL and the key of the thing to flush. And I go in and I say, first I delete the memcache key, and that immediately will get rid of that block so that new tasks can be added to the queue. And that, that's to get rid of the window of any race conditions. So that's kind of a funny lock around the task that's been enqueued. Um, then I go and I get the value out of memcache, the current counter value. If it's none, then I know that I have a cache failure, and that's the error condition, I failed. Um, and that should hopefully be a small window, but it's possible. So I'd have maybe some better error handling code in there. 
Uh, and then, then I just create a counter with a named key, I set the value, and I put it in the data store. That's it. Now, if this task fails at any moment, um, it should be able to pick up again. The memcache delete will just do nothing because I'm running the task again. Um, if there were another task that were, that were executed again on top of this one, they basically just do the same thing, that's fine. The queue will throttle them properly, so I don't have to worry about exceeding my uh, number of entity group writes per second. Um, uh, and then uh, the counter put will put over the top of whatever value is there. Um, so I, I have a very safe way of updating a counter and controlling the rate of, uh, of writes. So, demo. So I already have a few here. People have been messing around, that's cool. Uh, add foo so I can increment the count. Uh, let's see if it's working. I might have broken my code. Yeah, it looks like I broke my code. Um, well, it works. Now you're saying, well, you're probably saying to yourself, uh, I could write that. I have, I have something that looks just like that. You add a count and it adds shows up in a list. Why are you using task keys to do that? That's so silly. Um, but um, earlier when I was doing this demo, yeah, is it working now? Uh, meep, okay, there we go. Yeah, so it is, it is in increasing. I guess it just doesn't like foo. That's cool. Cool, all right, it's working. But you're like, yeah, so I say meep, I click increment. By the time it's reloaded, meep's at seven, right? Oh, I probably got some errors in there, so what happens is if a task fails, we back off for a little while, and then try again. So I, the code's a little buggy, so that's probably what's going on. Um, but let's look at my log. Uh, I have a counter here, um, and I've done a, uh, so here's a counter with a 302. This is my post, that's when I said increment. Then you see, so you see there's a post right here. Then the right behind comes through. That's the task running. So the, the first one comes at, um, so okay, so I, I say increment this counter at 18 seconds point one, uh, point one oh. The, the, the task is already running by 18.19, and then my browser does a round trip and finally re, re pulls the, the data at 18.42. So as, from, from the user's perspective, it's as if the page did the operation itself. Um, but it didn't work that way. It's all done in the background, but it just happens really quickly. Okay, so those are the practical things you can do. I'm just gonna talk about the future real quick and then we'll get into some questions. Um, so, Task Queue is coming soon. Uh, we're gonna release the Task Queue API in App Engine Labs. It's Python only at first, but Java is coming soon after. Um, the Java support in the works will support both the webhooks interface and we plan JMS integration. Um, now, like I said before, uh, this is not PubSub, but there are some very good mappings between uh, queuing systems and PubSub, so we're looking to have uh, some level of JMS compatibility uh, to, so that you can use JMS systems with our Task Queue API. Um, we're also working on a lot, of, a lot more Task Queue API features in, in the coming months. Um, a lot of management functions like flushing a queue. Uh, we wanna have the ability to, to view the contents of queues in the admin console. And we want you to be able to get uh, other webhook notification events when a queue has uh, uh, finished all of its processing or any kind of meta events uh, with the queue. Um, but let's talk more about the future of just offline processing and App Engine in general. So uh, with batch processing, you know, with batch processing, the, the Task Queue API is good for small data sets, you know, 100,000 rows or less. Um, but we really need some more tools for parallelization uh, high, and high throughput processing of data store entities. Uh, we need a really efficient way of splitting all of your data into pieces so that you can uh, uh, chunk through it uh, in parallel. Uh, right now we don't have enough tools for that, um, so we're working on those. Uh, we also need some better features for doing aggregations and statistics uh, uh, kind of calculations with your entities. Uh, so we'll hopefully get to those soon. Um, we also want to support MapReduce, full-on MapReduce, a MapReduce abstraction. Um, I don't know where this fits in our timeline, we're gonna talk more about it as, as time goes on, but um, before we get there, we need some more tools. We need uh, more efficient intermediary storage. Uh, the data store is quick, but it's not fast enough. We need something very fast if we wanna use a lot of data. We need something that's better for shorting and shuffling. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and especially because we want, to, want our MapReduce abstraction to work with both small data sets and very large data sets over a terabyte, um, that, uh, so, or bigger. Um, so to wrap up, use the Task Queue API uh, once it's launched. 
Um, make your existing app faster, lower latency, scale your app further with lower costs, add new functionality you couldn't implement before, the sky's the limit, you know, you can implement a, an event website for you and your friends, you can make a feed aggregator, there's all kinds of stuff you can do now you can never do before. Um, and take advantage of webhooks for easy debugging. Webhooks let you use a forum to test your workers. It's ridiculously easy. Um, so, let's get to questions. I think we have 10 minutes left. Um, there are mics here and here. Um, we also have them on moderator, and if you have more feedback, you can go to haveasec.com uh, slash io. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna go through the first three moderator and then I'll do the other questions. Uh, so um, if you guys wanna talk to each other, please go outside the room so we can all talk together here about the, this, this talk still. We'll also be at office hours for anyone who has questions, so come on by, uh, we'll be there all day. Uh, okay, so are tasks limited by the 30 second time limit? Yes, they are, <clears throat> they are. Um, we, so we let you segment tasks into multiple tasks, we let tasks add new tasks when they're done. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to segment your data. Um, we'd like them to be able to run longer. Uh, we're looking into it, but yes, for now, um, they, are, uh, they are also limited to 30 seconds. Um, can we limit the number of retries and have a method to process failed tasks, um, say failback or resolution handler? I think you can do a lot of this in, in user space right now by having some auxiliary, auxiliary uh, data. Um, but yeah, there's, this, is, this is one of those features that we could totally add on top of the uh, existing abstractions, so uh, it's something we'll definitely consider with all the other features we'd like to add. Um, and will the APIs uh, oh, provide the ability to query the queue, um, see how deep the processing rates, intercept tasks um, that have retried a bunch of times? Uh, so yeah, we'd like to provide APIs for all this stuff. Um, we're starting with the admin console to give you a lot of good diagnostics into how your queues are going, how old the tasks are, flow rates, error rates, uh, et cetera. Um, a lot of this centers on, around what the admin console needs to give you a great picture of what your queues are doing. Um, and we'd also like to provide those APIs to our users. Um, okay, I'll get to this one in a minute. So let's start with just questions in person. Yeah. Yeah, going back to your migration example, uh, you mentioned how important it is to put the migrated uh, entity before deleting the old one. I wonder whether you use key names to identify an entity. That's exactly what you use. Yeah, you use key names or the ID to identify the data. Um, so, yeah. But can you put the new entity to the same key name as the old one before yes, deleting it? Yes, if the it? kinds are different, you can. So, IDs and key names are specific to an entity kind, like a model class. So, you can use the same ID for both, and they won't affect each other because uh, the primary key is actually uses the kind. So, yeah, that's how you do it. So, the migrated entity would have to be a new kind. It would be, a, yeah, exactly. It would be a new kind. If you didn't want to do a new kind, you'd need to do some other kind of transformation on the key. Yep. Over here. If my uh, app is not an app engine, but I want to utilize your framework for queuing, is the API going to be available publicly so that I could hit it with requests and queue and pool items from it? Right, that's a good question. So, so you know, can I, so the, the first answer is uh, we have no plans or nothing to announce to that right now. There's nothing stopping you from implementing this as an app engine app itself. Um, uh, you could, if, especially if we had some queue operations to, to actually like in, have some introspection on a queue, you could do things like that. You could also use App Engine to run a queue and actually send webhook requests uh, back to uh, your own data center or to some other virtual, virtualized hosting uh, server or any other provider. So, um, you know, you can build an App Engine app to basically do whatever you want with your queue. It's up to you to kind of figure out how you want to do it. But the, the fundamental difference is that it's push, not pull. So our, our processing model is very different from a standard queue where you're constantly pulling off the lists. So I would write an app that I could hit from outside and give my tasks to, and then you guys push it back to me when that, it That's pops totally it an off. option if you want to do that. Yeah. Yep, you use a URL fetch API to do that. Yep. Uh, over here? Yeah, uh, I think you kind of announced something called App Engine Labs. Can you talk about what that is and how an App Engine Lab app works? Uh, sure, so App Engine Labs is gonna be a namespace within our API packages that lets you import new modules. Um, and packages in that namespace will be, uh, like I said, they might have some incompatible changes that we're gonna make over time. Uh, we're gonna warn you anytime we do those incompatible changes. And then eventually when it graduates from labs, we're gonna move it into our normal namespace 
at which point it will be backward compatible, will not break your code unless we do a uh, full version change um, uh, where in your app YAML you actually have to specify a new major version. So, um, and yeah, we're hoping to release more APIs under the labs uh, moniker. The, the idea is that we don't really know exactly what we want yet and we want to have user feedback, so this is a way of us giving you a preview without, without locking ourselves into you know, a problem. Um, and then the other part is what I said about billing. We're still trying to figure out how to bill for this properly, so that's, that's part of it. Um, okay, uh, let me just do another off moderator. Uh, how do you prevent a malicious user from using tasks to create tasks, uh, fork bomb? How do you avoid punishing legitimately bursty sites? Uh, yeah, this is a very good question. Um, uh, so quotas are one way. Um, by setting a reasonable small free limit, um, you know, a smaller free limit, we can prevent sites from doing uh, runaway queuing and kind of hosing themselves. Um, we would hope that sites that are, are paying customers who want to do some useful work uh, wouldn't try to hose themselves. But I think this comes into kind of queue management and queue introspection tools. Um, you know, you want to know if this has happened, if you haven't, because you can fork bomb yourself on accident. Um, so you want to make sure that you can diagnose this problem, maybe get alerts when it happens, stop a queue, flush a queue. Um, there's a lot of tooling we can do around this to uh, avoid fork bombs from hurting you. Um, and how do we avoid punishing legitimately bursty sites? Uh, I think that just fits into our whole scheme of quotas. Um, you know, we have reasonable quotas set for both free and paying apps, and as long as you're within those limits, it should make a difference. Uh, over here. You've spoken before about warm versus cold apps and how the first request is more expensive and slower than subsequent subsequent request in a limited period of time. How does queuing work with that? Yeah, so it's just like the rest of our infrastructure. We try to maximize our cache hit rate to your, to your run times. So, you know, we'll try to keep using a hot run time if we can. Okay. Um, it uses the same infrastructure as serving to do that. Let me do a couple more off the moderator real quick. Um, is there a way to define the retry policy? So this is probably like how much to back off, how quickly to back off. Uh, again, this is one of those features that we want to um, we want to look into more. Uh, we know that this is a feature people would like to have. Uh, for now, we're going to have just a simple exponential back off scheme. Um, I think it starts at 100 milliseconds, something like that, uh, and we'll get, we'll go from there. Uh, will there be a free quota? Yes, there will be a free quota. Uh, it's, we still like to stick with the, fr it's free to get started uh, with App Engine, and we'd like you to, to start using this uh, task API as soon as we release it. Um, will the post request be limited to one meg? Uh, we're still figuring out what the maximum size of tasks should be. Um, so, you know, it, it could be anywhere from 100K to 1 meg, 10K. We're not really sure. We're figuring out that the best. Um, we want to, we don't want people necessarily using the task queue for storage. It should be storing a description of work to do. So we're finding the right balance in terms of scalability. Um, and so we'll, we'll announce that when we announce the rest of the documentation. Um, and then the last one is, uh, or Last one I'll take here is, uh, is it possible to manually delete those tombstones? Um, right now it's not, uh, but we want to let you specify the tombstoning policy for named tasks so that you can say, hey, I want tasks to be immediately garbage collected, or I don't, or I want them to be garbage collected in 20 minutes. We, we're still figuring out some more features there, um, but we're aware of that as something people want. Uh, over here. Uh, could you give a sense of uh, when the Java support would come? Is it like weeks, months, or, and in the meantime, what's the best way to, you know, circumvent that using, like, mix of Python, Java, or? Yeah, so, um, I, I can't give you a, a good timeline on the Java support. I mean, we'd like it to be as soon as possible. So, I mean, within weeks of our Python launch, but I'm not really sure. Um, uh, yeah, you could use a hybrid model of uh, a Python app with a task queue and doing URL fetches between them. I, I wouldn't encourage you to do that. Um, yet, so hopefully we'll have code written so you can actually take advantage of this in Java as soon as possible. Um, that's the best answer I can give for now. Um, Thank you. Over here? Yeah, how would you go about counting the number of entities of a particular kind in the data store? Is that worth using a queue to, to do? Yeah, so you can do some aggregations like that. Um, essentially, you just do the schema migration except you store the counter in memcache, and you just migrate through all of the entities doing nothing and store the count. And by the time you get to the end, then the memcache contains the total. Uh, you can do all kinds of aggregations that way, sums, uh, sums, averages, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, uh, an aggregation is just a schema migration that does nothing, right, I guess. I, so, yep. Okay. 
Over here. Um, yeah, since tasks are just URL requests, is there some way that the re when the request is run, it can know if it's being run as a task? I, I, I was thinking about yes, the mail yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna have parts of the queue that let you have some introspection into the request itself. So you say, am I a task? Um, and you will be able to make sure that task queue handlers aren't run um, uh, by non-administrators, et cetera. So yeah, we're gonna have all, the, all that stuff. Um, so all right, that's all, we, all the time we've got. Um, please visit us in office hours. Uh, we'll answer more of your questions. And thanks a lot for coming.